eight years that Barack was president, it was sort of like having the the good parent at home, the one that told you to eat your carrots and go to bed on time. And now perhaps we have the other parent. Maybe it feels fun to some for now because we can eat candy all day and mm -hmm. you know stay up late <laughs> and not follow the rules. Dan Bongino joins us to assess the sanctimony on parade. So when they brought interest rates down to zero, shafting middle class savers because it was easier. Was that an example of eating your carrots? Yeah, the massive quantitative easing program that enriches investors and people with assets and exactly. decimates working class families. Yeah, terrific, Tucker. Uh, you know what's really r r offensive? I mean, really grotesquely offensive about that statement? Follow the rules, insinuating what? That Barack Obama was a rule follower? Uh, let me tell you something. In my history with the Secret Service and international security for 12 years, you know what one of the rules was, Tucker? You don't leave your people behind to die in a foreign country when the embassy or special mission complex is under attack. Uh, you know what else is another one of the rules? When you're an IRS special agent with 1811 law enforcement authority, you don't go and target conservative groups out there That's with true. a weaponized IRS. You know, here's one more doozy for you. Let me give you another rule. When you're an executive branch official, no less the president in charge of it, uh, you don't go out and usurp authority that is not yours on immigration by claiming prosecutorial discretion on people who cross the border illegally. Those are just a few rules Barack Obama can, can, just said. Ah, can you think, me. so the idea is, you know, we were brave and we told the truth even when it was unpopular. Can you think of a single example, and I can, I watched carefully for eight years, where Obama or his wife said anything that would be unpopular in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, or Washington, D.C., or Los Angeles. I mean, they seem to just read from the script of their friends. Did they ever challenge conventional wisdom on anything? You know, um, no. I, I, you know, let me, you know, to be fair, let me do one. There was one time I heard him give a speech about uh, Vietnam veterans, um, and I thought it was a good speech. And he basically gave no safe harbor to people who had attacked our Vietnam veterans. You know, the Democrat him. Party had, uh, and, and that was, but other than that, Tucker, he was a fake on taxes. He was awful on health care. He, he expanded the administrative state. Uh, he invented a bunch of presidential authority he didn't have. And I, I'd say with no reservations, he was, the, he was the worst president in my lifetime. I'm 43 years old. Absolutely no doubt about that on any metric. I wonder if he and he invited Al Sharpton over to the White House 70 odd times as a policy advisor. I wonder if he and his wife ever think, you know, we left this country so desperate and unhappy that they elected Donald Trump to secede us. I wonder, I mean, that's like kind of an obvious conclusion. Has it ever occurred to them? Uh, no, and, and, and Tucker, what's even worse about the Obama presidency, the constituencies he claimed to be a champion of, the poor, the working man, black, uh, black, uh, black people in, in, in middle-income in middle and lower-income communities in the inner cities, were left far worse off by Barack Obama. Tucker, income inequality got worse under the Bar uh, Barack Obama era. Black unemployment, inner cities, we saw rioting in inner cities, black unemployment was through the roof. These were the groups he claimed to want to defend. I, no, he left just about everybody worse off. You know, even you know, r racial discord in the United States by just about every available measure got yeah. worse. That's the legacy the Obama. Well, when presidents. Al Sharpton's your policy advisor, that tends to happen. I always forget, and my producer just reminded me in my ear that you protected President Obama. I mean, you were on his detail. I've seen pictures of it. How do you? I mean, I don't even know what to ask you. What? What do you? What do you remember about that? Or what is this? her uh, quote evoking you you know the worst part about it for me personally is he was a nice guy to me personally yeah. and I, I you know and I, I know you feel it's not personal to me politics isn't um, this is the business of running the country and so was his wife they were always very pleasant to be around they never gave us a hard time um, and he was a gentleman but you know what a lot of people are gentlemen and that's great but that doesn't make you an effective president of the United no, States Tucker. he hurt my wallet he hurt my health care he hurt my business and you know that's why I left I I, I couldn't take it I was he hurt sorry. the country but I'm still glad he was nice. Yeah. That actually does count to me. Uh, Dan, thank you for that. As always, great to see you. Several years ago, the Obama administration ordered schools to eliminate racial gaps in school discipline. They didn't say how to do this. It was like the old Soviet potato harvest. Just do it. Get the numbers up. And so schools complied in many cases simply by cutting back on discipline itself. The result, fewer students were suspended. On the other hand, schools across the country have seen fighting in the hallways and disorder in the classroom. That's real. 
Now, the Trump administration reportedly is planning to scrap that Obama-era rule. Heather McDonald is one of the people who's been following this from the very beginning. She's at the Manhattan Institute. She's a fellow and the author of the book, The War on Cops, and joins us tonight. Heather, thanks for coming on. This is one of those uh, policies that got a little bit of attention, but people didn't focus on it until the Parkland shooting, and it seemed implicated in that. Tell us what this did, this policy. Well, it penalized schools that had disparate rates of school discipline on the theory that the only possible reason why black students may be suspended at higher rates than white students is teacher bias. And so schools were warned by the Obama administration that they would lose federal funding, they were taken to court, unless they got their suspension and expulsion rates down. And so, as you say, Tucker, schools simply stopped imposing completely legitimate consequences on very serious forms of school disorder. Now, the premise underlying this Obama policy was completely false. It assumes, without even trying to prove, that there can be no behavioral disparities between black and white students. Well, if you look at crime rates, if you look at the fact that black males between the ages of 14 and 17 commit homicide at 10 times the rate of white and Hispanic male teens combined, it's not surprising that in the classroom, the same lack of socialization that leads to those wildly disproportionate rates of violent crime is also affecting student behavior. And we should be concerned about that behavior, try to get it at its root causes, and not blame s teachers for the completely phantom specious idea that they're racist. Well, that's, I mean, that's kind of exactly the point. One, this was not a science-based conclusion. It was purely ideological and not rooted in reality at all. Two, it doesn't help anybody to say, just change the numbers and ignore the root causes. Why did teachers' unions, Teachers were, as you said, effectively blamed for this. Yes. Why didn't they fight back? It's very curious. In some places they have. In Seattle they have. I believe in St. Paul. I think teachers are completely torn. I mean, this is another reason why it's so ludicrous to blame them for racism. Teacher ed schools are one long marinade in white privilege theory. There's no more liberal group of right. professionals in the country than teachers. and so. They're, they want to, in, in a sense, believe in their own white privilege, uh, and yet they will not speak out against the consequences of this. You have a reign of assaults against teachers in this country. In Buffalo, New York, a, student was, a, a teacher was kicked in his head by students who said, we can't be suspended. Students know what the new rules are, and they are taking advantage of it. That's just horrifying. And, and finally, did anybody... I mean, like so many social policies, they kind of take place sub rosa and the rest of us don't really notice. Did anyone complain about this at the time? It's so prima facie crazy, you'd think someone would. Did anyone? Well, uh, there's a very brave black teacher in St. Paul, Aaron Benner, who opposed as, as strongly as he could the very left-wing radical policies of the St. Uh, Paul School District and said, I am not helping my black students by winking at their school violence because you know exactly. what's going to happen? They're going to end up raping or murdering somebody and they'll end up in prison. Uh, and he basically had to leave his school for speaking truth to power. It's grotesque. Because it, it, you're exactly right. It does no service to the kids themselves. Heather, thank you for that. Thank I you. I appreciate it. That was amazing. George Soros is a billionaire, but somehow his own money isn't enough to fund the totality of his anti-American agenda. So, U.S. taxpayers had to step into the breach and help as well, and they did. Department of Justice documents, newly obtained by Judicial Watch, thank heaven, show that in 2016, the Obama administration, whose misdeeds are now just coming to light, gave almost $9 million to support something called the East-West Management Institute. That's a Soros-funded venture. According to Judicial Watch, the money did little other than empower the socialist government of Albania, which spends a lot of time making its people more miserable. Tom Fitton is the president of Judicial Watch, and he joins us tonight. One of the reasons I'm so glad that you're here, Tom, is because you kind of tie a bow on stories. The Obama administration's over, but there's a lot that they did that we don't know anything about because the press refused to cover those stories. Tell us this small piece of it. What did they do in Albania and why? 
Well, they're supporting the socialist communist government there, uh, the Soros operations, and they're doing it with taxpayer dollars. They were doing it in 2016, and they were even doing it in the first part of the Trump administration in 2017, co-sponsoring surveys of the population that generated 91% of the support in favor of the pro-government, pro-Soros operation that would have restricted the independence of the judiciary. Now, like all strongman governments, they don't like independent judiciaries, right. so they were trying to reform the judiciary in a way that would have brought it under control of the socialist government there. And what's troubling is that obviously Soros needs no taxpayer money to do any of this advocacy work, uh, but the State Department and USAID is partnering with Soros uh, and basically s allowing Soros to set our foreign policy agenda. And then secondly, Soros's operations, according to these documents, were allowed to come into the State Department and provide technical reviews of other applications for other government money in Albania. But, I mean, George Soros hates the United States, and I'm judging that by the projects that he funds, all of which are designed to change the country as it is now or to thwart U.S. interests. So why in the world? Would any State Department give money to a Soros-funded operation? Well, it's not only in Albania. We have four, had four lawsuits at one point. Albania, Romania, he's active in Hungary, Guatemala, Colombia. Uh, they're very, very active, and it doesn't take a lot of money. Uh, to have a big impact in these countries and the governments are under assault from the Soros State Department unity effort uh, to bring socialism and stop anything in the area of reform, constitutionalism, the sort of things that Americans would be comfortable with, the Soros groups aren't. And you know, look, He's a billionaire. He doesn't need the money. And when you fund him in one place, it means he has more money to spend elsewhere. So if you don't like what Soros is doing here at home, you should know it's being indirectly subsidized thanks to the State Department and USAID, at least as early as, at least as soon as long ago as 2016. So Soros is getting State Department money. Planned Parenthood, which is an arm of the Democratic Party, gets a half a billion a year in taxpayer funds. Is there any right of center or pro America group that gets any taxpayer funding of any kind? Well, I think most of them don't think they ask for it. Uh, but uh, certainly the State Department is not terribly interested in funding groups that are antagonistic to their agenda abroad. And this is kind of another way for the State Department to stick it to the Trump administration. Yeah. Because some of this activity was taking place in early 2000.